All right, turn your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to read verse 1 and then skip down to verses 6 and 7. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, and then verses 6 and 7. And the scripture reads, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Verse 6, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. Let me read that again. By faith, uh, but without faith, it is impossible to please Him. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. Amen. By grace are you saved through faith. He says here, without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Now, there are some people that seem to be preaching today that in this age of grace that you don't have to do anything. Well, you better put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ or you will die and go to hell. You do have to trust Christ as Savior. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, that's where it begins. Notice he goes on to say in verse 6, For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them, that diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is by faith. I want to preach this morning on the faith of Noah. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I beg you again this morning for the filling of the Holy Ghost of God. Lord, I know my voice is weak, but you don't need a strong voice to move upon hearts. All we need is the power of the Holy Spirit to take your word deep into a heart. Lord, I pray today that there's one here without Christ. They've never truly been born again. May they see their need for the Son of God and trust him today. Lord, there are other lessons in here about the faith of Noah. May we grab them. May we hold them dear. May we, Lord, get right where we need to get right. Do a mighty work in our hearts, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> think about this for a second. What would it be like to be the only Christian person in your entire state? To be the only one. What about to be the only Christian in your entire country? Or what about, in Noah's case, what would it be like to be the only Christian in the world? The only one. Now, I'm, when I say the only one, I'm talking about Noah and, of course, his family, because his family becomes a part of this. But they were the only ones that had faith in the Lord God of the Bible. Now, it'd be easy for them to be branded as cultist because they did not believe like anybody else. They were the only ones. Now, there's no doubt, we'll see this in the scripture, that there's no doubt that, that Noah did share his faith. But apart from his family, no one else partook in it. No one else. And he just didn't do it on Thursday nights. As a matter of fact, the ark that he ended up building that took 100 years to build, that ark was a constant testimony of his faith in the true God of heaven. I mean, everybody walking by could see, hey, there's something different about this guy. He's strange. He's different. And that's for sure. Now, Hebrews chapter 11 is the faith chapter. Some have called it the hall of faith. We learn it is impossible to please God without faith. And then the scripture says, by faith, Noah. 
Now, he's not the first one mentioned with faith in this chapter. For we find Abel had faith in verse 4. We find Enoch had faith in verse 5. And then we have the warning for everybody, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, this is key. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 22, have faith in God. He did not say have faith in faith. He did not say have faith in prayer. He said have faith in God. That's where our faith needs to be put. Now, the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 6, when we are introduced to God dealing with Noah to have him build an ark, the Bible says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The only one, think about that, the only one in a wicked planet. As a matter of fact, let's turn back to Genesis chapter 6 for just a moment and see how God identifies the days of Noah. The scripture says <coughs> in verse 1, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. Were, uh, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in under the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, and the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. Now look at this. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now that's God's testimony of the world in Noah's day. Now I read this. And God saw the wickedness of man that it was great in the earth. I wonder what God sees today. You think God sees that the wickedness of man is great in the earth? I mean, after all, if you just took a look at the internet today, I'd say you would have to say worldwide the wickedness of man is great in the earth. If you pay attention to what's going on in country after country, the murders, the slayings, all that's taking place with all of our technology that we have, we haven't become more civilized. We've become even less civilized. And the wickedness of man is great in all the earth. You would think that we would have wiped out human trafficking by now. But you see, because of things like abortion, we have counted the life of any human being as being nothing more than the life of an animal. As a matter of fact, you've got groups like PETA that put the life of animals above the life of any human being. And the wickedness of man was great. I want you to know God notices the wickedness of man. As a matter of fact, as God took notice here, you'll get down to verse 6 and it says, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him at his heart. Do you think maybe he's grieved today? He was grieved in Noah's day. Thing is, there's a lot more people on the planet right now than there was in Noah's day. I mean, we're closing in on six billion people on the planet. And the wickedness that abounds. Now notice verse 7. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Both man and beast and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Now, I just want to point out to you that the God who is love destroyed a world. I don't want you to be fooled by the, the God that's being preached in a lot of churches today, that God is love, therefore... 
He makes no one answer for their sins. That God who is love is a holy and a righteous God. That God who is love still judges sin today. As a matter of fact, he describes for some of the things that are going to be taking place in the future in the book of the Revelation, where billions will be wiped out at one time. And it is the God who is love that will do it. I just want you to have an accurate view of the God who is love. Now, the next verse says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You go to verse 11, it says, the earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. Are we filled with violence? Of course. And God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. So that's God's testimony of that day. Now, Noah's story is not just recorded for us in the book of Genesis. It's mentioned here in the book of Hebrews. Twice, the apostle Peter refers to Noah. In 1 Peter 3.20, it says, which sometimes were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing within few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. And then in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, he says, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Now, G Jesus also spoke of Noah. As a matter of fact, he likened the days to the return of Jesus Christ to the days of Noah. A day of eating and drinking. That is, when no one's really paying attention to God. As a matter of fact, I'd probably say in this nation, there was more attention being paid to the Super Bowl than there was to the fact that Jesus could have come back before that Super Bowl even came. Amen. Did you hear me say that Jesus could have come back before the Super Bowl even came? He could come tonight. For that matter, he could come this morning. People are all caught up in all kinds of things. They're worried about the economy. They're worried about all kinds of things that really don't matter. Worried about SARS. And SARS is coming back, you know. I mean, China's got its problems, doesn't it, with SARS and the coronavirus and all that kind of stuff that's going on. And people are beginning to panic. Well, they ought to be panicking about the fact that Jesus could come back today and then. The tribulation would start Daniel's 70th week and great judgment will be poured out upon the planet. But back to Noah. I want you to notice some things about Noah because from the passage that we read in the book of Hebrews, he makes a special emphasis of the faith of Noah. I want you to notice some things about his faith. Number one, his faith was a simple faith. What do you mean? He took God at his word. God told Noah to go build an ark, and he built it. He took God at his word. We do not find Noah saying, why? Noah doesn't say, by the way, when he gets the command, Noah is about 500 years old. You'd think it'd be time for retirement. God's got a job for him. He's going to have to build an ark, and it's not going to be a little one. How many here have been to the Ark Encounter up in, uh, up in Kentucky? Okay, a few of you have. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I've tried to picture the Ark in my head and all that. But it wasn't until we were walking up to the Ark that I understood how gigantic this thing was. And as far as we know, the only ones to build it, and that's not to say Noah could not have hired out some people to help him build it. And uh, I'm sure there were some people that would have been glad to get whatever wage he paid at that time. But to build, they, they didn't have the stuff that we have today. To build that gigantic ark, it took him 100 years. Well, when you see it, you understand why. It's also an engineering marvel. Of course, he did get some instructions from the Lord. And there's no doubt that helped him. But his faith was a simple faith. God said he would destroy the world. God told him there'd be a flood 
And at this point, Noah hadn't even seen it rain. At this point, every morning, a dew came up on the earth. And that's where all the plants got watered and all that was taken care of. So you understand, when Noah's going to go out to preach to others to try to get them to get in the ark and to be saved, uh, he's doing that. He's telling them, well, why? Well, there's going to be a flood. Well, why is there going to be a flood? Going to be a flood because we're going to have 40 days and 40 nights of rain. What? We're going to have what? 40 days and 40 nights of rain. God's going to judge the earth. Well, why is he going to judge the earth? Because of your wickedness. Bible says that he was a preacher of righteousness. A preacher of righteousness to a wicked people. And not just a wicked neighborhood. But all that lived on the earth except for Noah's family were wicked. They're all going to die. It's a true message. His is a simple faith. Now, if you've seen the ark, and by the way, there are a couple of them that have been built. I think there's one over in Norway or Sweden that some guy built as well. Um, you know, it took Noah 100 years. It only took them up in Kentucky about, about six years to build the whole thing. But then you look at all the equipment they had, you can understand why they got it done in six years. Uh, this, this is a monster thing. What an undertaking. The size, the dimension. Uh, as far as we know, his workforce would be his sons. Maybe his daughter-in-laws would have something to do with that. Uh, but it's just a simple faith. There's no argument about it. He just does it. You know, when I got saved, I found out that I was, I was a Christian. I ought to be going to church. Amen. I didn't argue about it. Amen. We went. I didn't sit there and say, well, you know, back at that time, by the way, in the early 1970s, they were just starting to have the doubleheader football games on Sunday every once in a while. Well, that ran into church time. I remember before I got saved, where I was in a Sunday school class, and the Sunday school teacher said, uh, listen, for, for you folks, this is the Lord's day. He said, instead of, instead of going home and watching the NFL... He said, why don't you go home and after you eat, sit down, read your Bible. And I thought, now I wasn't saved yet, and I thought, that man's crazy. Why on earth would I do that? Now, to be honest with you, I know I saw a lot of football games during that time. I don't remember one of them. Amen. Not one. That guy had something on the ball, giving the Lord's day to the Lord. I mean, it's already his. But no argument, he just began. I, I think of Joseph in Matthew chapter 1. He showed a simple faith when he found out that Mary was expecting and, the Holy, and, the, and an angel of the Lord spoke to him and said, that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And he was to take her as his wife and he was to name the child Jesus. And you know what? He just obeyed it. That's a simple faith. A simple faith that just obeys. I, I didn't, to get saved, I didn't have to have a miraculous faith. It was just simple faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I saw myself as a sinner on my way to hell. And I wasn't thinking about how I had to put so much money in the offering plate or go to church or anything. I just knew I was lost and Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sins. I was going to hell. He rose from the dead so I could be justified before God. And I decided to stop trusting my good works, my life, just put my trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. And according to the scripture, he saved me. Amen. Just a simple faith. Simple faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. His faith was not only a simple faith, it was a saving faith. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves... It is a gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. It is not the size of our faith. It is the object of our faith that counts. Philippian jailer fell down before Paul and Silas, and he cried out, What must I do to be saved? And the answer is so simple. He said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. I love it. When later, Philip, or earlier, Philip is talking to the Ethiopian eunuch. And he's talking about the Lord Jesus that is the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 53. Those messianic verses that are so powerful in the book of Old Testament book of Isaiah. And he came upon some water 
And he knew something about baptism, but uh, he wasn't fully understanding. And he said to Philip, he said, what hinders me? What keeps me from getting baptized? And Philip said to him, he said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Amen. He said, all right, get out of the chariot. It's time to get wet. Now, it wasn't the getting wet that saved him. When he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's when he got saved. And he followed the Lord in baptism because that's what Jesus commanded to do after you get saved. Amen. It's not a hard thing. You know, I don't find anyone in the New Testament that got saved that refused to be baptized. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us about the baptism of everyone that got saved. He tells us about the baptism of many people that got saved. He doesn't tell us about the baptism of everyone that got saved. But we do not find one person who got saved ever refusing to be baptized. And you know what? They didn't wait. They didn't wait. They got baptized right away. I mean, 3,000 were saved on the first day. And the disciples, didn't, they didn't know how many were going to get saved. They didn't sit back and say, now, how are we going to do this? Man, they just started baptizing like Jesus said to do. Jesus said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And they just did that. And then he said, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. Not only was his faith a saving faith and it was a simple faith, but his faith was a serving faith. Because he got busy building the ark. Now, that doesn't mean that he nailed his first board the first day. Wood had to be cut. God didn't cut the wood for him. Now, this is a... I'm, I'm, still, I'm, I'm still thinking about walking up on that, the ark encounter there in Kentucky. And, uh, man, this took some forethought. This took some planning. And I can't imagine how he went through all that, but he just, he got to work. It was, a, it was a serving faith. I got news for you. Saving faith brings changes. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 declares clearly, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are, be, are become new. Now, you don't change in order to get saved. When you get saved, the product of that salvation is he changes you. You say, what if there's no change? Now, I'm sorry, you didn't get it. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, he declares clearly in that verse, he says, be not deceived. He says... Matter of fact, I'm going to turn to it. It just went right out of my head. Okay. I still remember it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And maybe the Lord wants you to turn to it too. That's why he didn't have me just quote it. <coughs> he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. He says, Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now, he makes this very plain. These people aren't going to heaven. And then he says to these Christians at Corinth, and such, and you might circle the word, were some of you. But ye are washed. But ye are sanctified. But ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. What happened to these people? When they got saved, they became something else. The fornicators, when they got saved, they became something else. The thieves, when they got saved, became something else. The drunkards, when they got saved, became something else. The revilers, when they got saved, became something else. The, the abusers of themselves with mankind, when they got saved, they became something else. How'd that happen? Well, the Holy Spirit of God made them a new creature. He said, and such were some of you. There's a song that we sing, there's been a great change 
since I've been born again. The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. Now, why? Because I'm a new creature. The old creature did it. The new creature doesn't do it. He made me a new creature when I got saved. I'm simply saying it's a serving faith. You show me a person who says they're saved and you can't drag them to church, I just doubt that they got saved. You show me a person that's a drunkard to get saved, but he goes right back to his booze, I think what we got is the dog returning to his vomit. Because sheep don't do that. When you get saved, you become a sheep. I don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Your works do not save you, but they're pretty good evidence of whether or not you got it. Listen, I didn't have to hear a message against cussing to quit cussing. I got saved. My cussing stopped. He said, did you give up the booze? I got news for you. I didn't drink before I got saved. Never saw any sense in it. I mean, all I ever saw out of booze was heartache and trouble. My mom and dad were drinkers. I mean, we lived in a whole society of drinkers. All I saw was the mess that it brought. I didn't want that mess in my life. I didn't smoke, man. I had an uncle who died with lung cancer. Why on earth when I was, as a kid, I understood that, you know, that's not a smart thing to do. Amen. I didn't have to get saved to understand that. Now, I realize some people did have to get saved to understand it. And that's all right. I get that. I get that. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But uh, now, they may have prayed a prayer with right words, but praying a prayer doesn't save you. You've got to put your faith, for by grace are you saved through faith. You got to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to save you. <clears throat> you show me a person who says they're saved living in open fornication and immorality. I've got good reason to doubt whether or not they really got it. Amen. So we see his faith. We see what it did for him. We see the beauty of his faith. Then we see the burden of his faith. Because the scripture says, for instance, in verse 7 of the passage where we were at in the book of Hebrews... The scripture says, by faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. So he had an immediate burden for his own family. But then we also know that he was a preacher of righteousness that went out and preached the gospel to others. That's what he did. We see the burden over a lost world. Now, if there's any place where there ought to be a burden for those without Christ, it ought to be in the church of Jesus Christ. I thank God somebody had a burden for me or I'd still be lost. I thank God that somebody cared whether or not I got in the house of God or I heard Bible preaching or I'd still be lost. The great commission of the church of Jesus Christ is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Why? He didn't just die for us. He died for everybody. Amen. He wants everyone to be saved. That's what we're about. Seeing people get saved. We just don't huddle together on Sunday. We can have a little fellowship and then go home and let the world die and go to hell all around us. We have a responsibility to get the gospel. Hey, coming to church is so we get the knowledge that we need and the encouragement that we need to go and tell the world about Jesus and then then get saved, get them in here so they can end up doing the same thing as well. William Burns was a man who became a mighty Scottish evangelist. And so uh, the story is told that when he was 17 years of age, <coughs> he and his mother had made a trip to Glasgow. Or, I'm not sure how you say that, but anyway, they got separated in the crowd and the mother obviously became very anxious. So she's walking around crying out for her son. She passed an alleyway and she looked down the alleyway and she noticed her son was seated on a little box. He had his head in his hands and he was crying. And she asked him, what was, what's the matter? And he said, oh, mother, mother, the thud of these Christless feet on their way to hell breaks my heart. When was the last time you wept for a soul? Scripture says, they that sow in tears shall reap with joy. Do you weep for the lost without Christ? You know, the world may mock judgment, but judgment's coming. The world may make jokes about hell, 
but a burning hell is still where people go to who die without Jesus Christ. There's no doubt that Noah was mocked when he told them that the God of heaven was going to judge them and has already judged them for their sin. And although he would provide an escape, if they didn't take it, they would die in their sin. The world mocks judgment today. They make fun of us who preach hellfire and damnation. Are you a hellfire and damnation preacher? Well, yes, I am. Amen. Why? Because everybody who dies without Jesus, that's what they're going to be in. Good night. The Bible's plain about that. Now, by the way, Noah was the best friend they had. He told them the truth. He told them the truth. He was a good watchman, wasn't he? Telling them the truth. Now, you've got the burden for a lost world. You've also got the burden of simply building the ark. Uh, now, only God knows the sacrifice that he went through. He had to get the material. He had to make the boards to fit. A hundred years in building that ark. Think about the enormity of the task. I don't know how many hours a day they spent. Now, they had a hundred years, and a hundred years may be a long time. But I'll tell you what, when a task like that, I would be overwhelmed. God gave the plan and the dimensions. Now, if you go to the ark experience up there in, uh, up there in Kentucky, that ark, which they say is the, proper, is the proper length and everything, is 510 feet long, 85 feet wide, 51 feet high. And of course, they did it in six years, and it took a tremendous crew to get that done and a lot of machinery to get it done. But not only was there the burden of the lost world and the burden of the building of the ark, but there was the burden of a laughing world. Imagine the ridicule. Now, the first few days, when he's just got boards being laid out, the first couple of years, before he starts putting things together, and here he is, a preacher of righteousness, letting them know what's going on, that God's going to judge them. Imagine what it was like, though, after 50 years. Yeah, same old stuff. Come on, Noah, get off that. What is wrong with you, Noah? Their gods didn't pronounce judgment on them. Their gods, and who knows, maybe even some of them called their God Jehovah. But it wasn't the Jehovah that was speaking to Noah. There are a lot of people that claim to be Christians, but their God doesn't judge anybody. Well, I'm sorry, that's not the God of the Bible. Jesus pronounced a lot of judgments. He pronounced judgments on the Sadducees and Pharisees. He said, woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, over and over again, with a woman that was taken in adultery. Jesus could not have her stoned because he was not one of the witnesses personally there, and it took two witnesses. All her witnesses had left her. But he let that woman know that he knew about her sin when he said, go thy way and sin no more. He made it plain that what she had done was sin, and he knew it. He told the truth about her sin. So here's Noah bringing a message of judgment, and to do that, he had to preach against their sin. God hates your sin. God will judge you for your sin. Imagine after 95 years, and the ark has taken great shape, and he's probably at this point simply working on the inside of the ark and doing stuff in there that people cannot see because there's a lot to get ready for all the animals that are coming to the ark. And uh, imagine how the people mock then. Well, keep your hand here in Hebrews and go over to Second Peter just a moment, chapter 3. <coughs> Notice, beginning in verse 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this, now notice this, for this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. They're going to mock both the creation 
and they're going to mock the flood that God brought upon a sinful planet. They mock it. And that's what they do today. They do exactly the same thing. We take God at his word. And then there's the burden of the lingering storm. He knew the storm was coming. And those of us who are truly saved know that judgment is coming. Hell awaits all who are lost. Then there's the blessing of Noah's faith. There's the blessing of relief. He saved his house. You know, Noah was not the most effective preacher that's ever walked on the planet. But he was effective enough to get his family saved. And you know, I'll tell you what, to me, if I want a million souls to Christ and my family died and went to hell, I'd be a failure. I want to see my family in heaven. Amen. Thank God my daughters are saved. Amen. As far as I know, all of my grandchildren have made a profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God for that. May the circle be unbroken all the way through, man. Now, my dad, that's another matter. My grandpa, they died without Jesus. My, my grandma Allison, she died without Jesus too, as far as I know. I've got a lot of aunts and uncles I'm not going to see in heaven. But at least for my family, I know they're going to heaven. Praise God. Man, that's a wonderful thing to know your family's going to heaven. Noah's family went to heaven. His three sons. Now, can you imagine the difficulty he had in raising them? I mean, he had to raise them up. He already had the plan from God. He already had the command from God, evidently, when they came along, when they were born. But we don't find any rebellion with these guys. I mean, by the time the ark is built, his boys are around 100 years of age. He didn't have any uh, generation gap there. There was no divide. There evidently was no rebellion because they all entered into the ark. I remember when my daughters were born, I began, since we got saved just before we, our first daughter was born, we started praying right away, Lord, please save our children the moment they come to that age of accountability. We didn't stop there. Lord, may they live for Jesus too. I don't want them just to be saved. I want their lives to count for God. I mean, after all, the God that I served is worthy of my children serving him too. So we raised him with that in mind. There's the blessing of reward. He became an heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. Yes, forgiveness of sin. But not only that, having his daily presence, being able to serve him with a work that counts for all eternity in the salvation of souls. Now, I read a story several years ago about a young man who did an amazing thing. His name was Spencer. It was back in 1860. His name was Edward Spencer. On Lake Michigan, there was a tour ship that was giving people a ride from Chicago up to Milwaukee, and they were out on Lake Michigan. Well, there ended up being a wreck. Their storm had come up. Uh, the Lady El Elgin was the name at, at 2 a.m. in the morning. The Lady Elgin collided with the schooner Augusta. And uh, that was near Waukegan, Illinois. The Lady El Elgin was carrying 300 passengers. And a crew that numbered a few more on a round-trip sightseeing tour. About a half hour afterwards, the Lady Elgin began to break apart. People were dumped into the ocean and... As a matter of fact, most of the 300 drowned. Some of the people that jumped out, though, were able to grab onto some wood and so on. But here it was early in the morning, still pretty dark. And people could see the Lady Elgin breaking apart off the coast. Nobody, it seemed, could do anything. But there was a young man going to college who was a championship swimmer. His name was Edward Spencer. He tied a rope around his waist and had some people hold the rope while he dove into the water to swim out to try to save someone. 
he finally got a hold of one and he made the people tug on the rope and he kept a hold of that person and he brought that person in from the icy waters of Lake Michigan. People were caring for that one and he said, boys, there's more out there. I see a lady out there struggling and he dove into the water again and he swam out. He was the only one doing this. He saved another and then he saved another and then he saved another. He had saved 10 and his body no doubt was freezing from all that he had done. He had suffered some cuts and bruises from, of the, from some of the stuff from the shipwreck. But he looked out there and he said, there's a man out there. It looks like he's trying to, it's looked like he's trying to help his wife. And he dove back in and he went out and he got the wife. Then he dove back in and he got the husband. He ended up bringing 18 people, one of which died. But 17 people ended up being saved that night. He couldn't go anymore. His body was just totally whipped with all that he had been through. There was nothing else he could do. Out of the 300 passengers, that's all that were saved that night. They took Edward Spencer to a room. They covered him up. His body was just not only in total exhaustion, it seemed, but obviously he was suffering for hypothermia as well. And he lay there in the bed with the covers upon him and practically in delirium. His brother came up to where he was and he said, well, well, did I do my duty? Did I do my best? His brother said, you saved 17. I know, I know, but... But did I do my best? And that thought haunted him for the rest of his life. As a matter of fact, from that point on in his life, Edward Spencer was, a, was wheelchair bound. And every time he would think about that time, he would ask the question, did I do my best? Did I? He was haunted by that. Now, further testimony, by the way, never in his life did one of those that he saved ever come back and thank him. But that really wasn't the point. In 1924, that's 64 years after the Lady Elgin went down, Ensign Edward Young heard about Spencer's story, and he wrote a hymn, I Wonder. Have I done my best for Jesus? You hear the story about Spencer diving out there, ruining his health and his body to save 17 people. And this man's a wonder. Do you realize those people that died that night, any of those that died, if they were saved, they went to heaven. But lost people are out there and we know it. We're without excuse. All they need to do is get into the ark, the Lord Jesus Christ. And they do that by faith, but they won't do it unless somebody tells them. And that's our job. Let me ask you, are we doing our best? We don't have to dive into the icy waters and risk drowning. Are we just doing our best? to tell them that's a serving faith. I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus? Let's bow our heads. Father, I pray you deal with our hearts today. First of all, if there's one here without Jesus Christ as Savior, they must come to him if they want to go to heaven. And I pray, dear God, they come to the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, this morning and be saved. I pray for believers. By faith, Noah. His faith was a serving faith. As a matter of fact, because of Noah's faith, we're alive today. Had there not been Noah's faith, then all the world would have perished in that flood. So Lord, I pray you deal with our hearts today, believers' hearts. Are we what we ought to be as believers in reaching the lost for Christ?
Have your way in every heart and life, I plead in Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed, 